Hello. In this video, we are going to prove the following theorem. Suppose c is a real number. Then the limit as x approaches c of x squared is equal to c squared. Now really, we're trying to determine the limit of a function. And we're going to say that the function we're working with is the function f from the set of real numbers to the set of real numbers defined by f of x equals x squared. Now, what does it mean for the limit as x approaches c of x squared to equal c squared? Well, if we recall, from the epsilon delta definition of the limit of a function, what this means is, is the following. It means for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all real numbers x in the domain of our function, if zero is less than absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then the absolute value of x squared minus c squared is less than epsilon. And the whole goal in proving this theorem is to prove this limit. And to prove it, we're going to prove that this statement is true. And since we're trying to prove a statement about all epsilon greater than zero, give me an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. From here, we want to find a delta greater than zero, which makes this statement turn out true. Now, let's pretend as though we've already figured out what to choose delta to be. And with this choice of delta, we want to show that this statement is true. So we're trying to prove a statement about every real number. So give me an arbitrary real number. I'll call x. And from here, we want to show if this is true, then this is true. So let's suppose that this is true. From here, we want to show that the absolute value of x squared minus c squared is less than epsilon. So let me start out by writing the left-hand side of this inequality. Now, we want to make this guy less than epsilon. And in the process of making this guy less than epsilon, we're going to figure out what we should choose delta to be. Now, where should we even start? Well, since we're working under an assumption about absolute value x minus c, it might be nice if we bring absolute value of x minus c into our work. Well, we know that x squared minus c squared is equal to x minus c times x plus c. And this is just equal to absolute value of x minus c times absolute value of x plus c. So we have brought absolute value of x minus c into our work. And we know that absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. So if we take this inequality, and multiply absolute value x plus c on both sides, well, since absolute value of x plus c is greater than or equal to zero, this means we have this. So this is true. So that takes care of the absolute value of x minus c. So now we just have to take care of the absolute value of x plus c. Okay, but what do we do with it? Well, maybe we can somehow relate absolute value of x plus c to absolute value of x minus c. Well, let's rewrite x plus c as x minus c plus 2c. By the triangle inequality, the absolute value of this is less than or equal to the absolute value of this plus the absolute value of this. So as you can see, we have rewritten absolute value of x plus c using absolute value of x minus c. And we know that absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, so this entire thing must be less than delta plus absolute value of 2c. And we know that absolute value of 2c is the same thing as 2 times the absolute value of c. So what we've shown here is that absolute value of x plus c is less than delta plus two absolute value of c. Well, if we go back to what we have here and we take delta and multiply it on both sides of this inequality, 
Well, since delta is greater than zero, this will result in this. So this guy must be less than delta times delta plus two absolute value of C. So as you can see, we started here and we have arrived here and no more X's are remaining. So maybe it's at this point, we should try to figure out what we should define delta to be, right? Remember the whole goal is to make this less than epsilon. So we need to define delta in such a way that we can make this less than epsilon. Now, a trick that we can use in defining delta is to define delta so that delta is the smaller of a list of positive numbers. For example, if we define delta so that delta is less than or equal to one, well then let's apply this inequality to this delta, right? Let's add two absolute value C to both sides of this inequality. Well then this is true. And then multiplying delta on both sides of this inequality, well, since delta is greater than zero, what we get from that is this. So this must be true. So if we define delta in such a way that delta is less than or equal to one, then we will arrive at this. But then all we gotta do to make this less than epsilon is to make sure delta is less than or equal to epsilon over one plus two absolute value of C. Right, it's perfectly fine if we wanna do this because epsilon over one plus two absolute value C is a positive number, right? And if we define delta so that delta is less than or equal to epsilon over one plus two absolute value C, well, if we multiply one plus two absolute value C on both sides of this inequality, well, since one plus two absolute value C is greater than zero, what we get from that is this. So this must be true. And we see that the one plus two absolute value C's will cancel out. This entire thing is just equal to epsilon. So now we see that absolute value of x squared minus c squared is less than or equal to delta times absolute value of x plus c, which is less than epsilon. Putting that together, this means we have shown absolute value of x squared minus c squared is less than epsilon. So what we see here is if we take delta so that delta is the smaller of these two positive numbers, then we will be able to arrive at this argument. So now let's put this all together. We see that under the assumption X is a real number. We have, if this is true, then this is true. Since X is arbitrary, this means we have shown for all real numbers X, if this is true, then this is true. So we have found a value for delta, which makes this statement turn out true. Well, that means we have proven that this is true. And we proved that this is true under the assumption of some arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. Since epsilon was arbitrary, this means we have shown for all epsilon greater than zero, this is true. So we have proven this entire statement, which means we have proven the limit. And that is exactly what we wanted to prove. So this completes the proof. And so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.